Good morning, everybody. I'm Simon Kenn, an interventional cardiologist and head of the TAVI program at the London Chess Hospital, and I would like to welcome you to this Radcliffe Cardiology webinar in which I hope to describe to you the historical outcomes of aortic valve replacement that led to the development of TAVI, the results of randomized trials in high-risk cohorts that demonstrated the benefit of TAVI in these patients, the evolution in TAVI procedures that has occurred over the last seven years, the improvement in outcomes in high-risk registries also over the last seven years, a review of contemporary surgical outcomes, and finally, a review of the three main ongoing randomized controlled trials comparing TAVI and aortic valve replacement surgery in intermediate risk patients. So we know that aortic stenosis has a poor prognosis untreated when symptoms such as heart failure, syncope and angina develop. And we know that conventional aortic valve replacement surgery is an excellent operation that's been around now for over 50 years. But there is no doubt it is a substantial undertaking that involves opening the chest, going on the heart-lung bypass machine, cutting out the native valve, and suturing in a prosthetic valve. As a result, UK Society of Cardiothoracic Surgeons data suggests it involves an average length of stay of 12 days, a stroke rate of 2 to 3%, and we can see that as age increases, the risks of mortality increase such that in those aged over 80, the mortality is between 6 and 11%. And mortality increases significantly with increasing Euroscore. And it was in response to this that TAVI was developed. Now, this is a still image of our first TAVI procedure performed in December 2008, but you can download the video of the procedure in the attachments. This was a transatical procedure in an 81-year-old man with previous cardiac surgery and peripheral vascular disease. We did two procedures that day, and this man, the first case, was awake, sitting up, and drinking tea by the time we finished the second case. This is the first uh, transfemoral case, which we performed in 2009, this was a 90-year-old man with previous cardiac surgery who went home four days later and remains alive today. So this is a step change, or this was a step change in the treatment of aortic stenosis. Since then, we've seen the publication of enormous amount of data on TAVI, including the partner trial, where in cohort B, super elderly and high-risk patients were randomized to either TAVI or conservative treatment with a significantly and substantially lower mortality in the treatment arm, i.e. in the TAVI cohort. And in the slightly lower risk cohort A, the 30-day mortality was non-significantly lower than the 30-day AVR mortality, the one-year stroke risk for TAVI was non-significantly higher with the same p-value, and the one-year mortality was the same for both arms. And there was, of course, a significant improvement in NYHA class with both AVR and with TAVI. Three further important points from this trial are that valve area post-procedure was greater after TAVI than AVR, which is good, uh, aortic regurgitation was more common after TAVI, which is bad, and that the length of stay was shorter, significantly shorter, after TAVI than after AVR. Since then, there have been significant advances in this field relating to evolving valve technology, which biotech companies have invested heavily in. But I'm not planning to focus on these developments today. What I would like to discuss is the way the TAVI pathway has been simplified and made less invasive over the last seven years with innovations in both technology and process. And I'm going to review each of these areas in turn to see what progress has been made and what opportunities there are for further progress. So at the London Chest Hospital, our investigation routine in 2008 involved a lot of time some contrast and some discomfort with the transesophageal echo. And you can see that 
this part of the pathway has been massively simplified over the last six years, and that is principally because of the development of high-quality CT imaging, which allows us to analyze vascular access, the aortic root, the left ventricular outflow tract, coronary arteries, uh, and importantly, of course, the aortic valve itself. Choosing the size of the prosthetic valve is crucial. If you get it too big, you risk annular rupture. Too small, you risk severe aortic regurgitation. And initially, the aortic valve was assessed in a rather rudimentary way with 2D TOE. But now, the assessment involves a much more sophisticated algorithm using CT to measure annular area, and we generally aim for a 5 to 15% area oversize. So what's on my wish list for future developments in this part of the pathway? Well, non-contrast CT assessment of the aortic valve would be very useful. CTs currently require 60 to 100 mils of contrast, and this remains a significant load for elderly patients with even mild impairment of renal function. Also, improvement of CT assessment of calcified coronary arteries would be useful. Currently, any significant coronary calcification, and this is present in about 50% of patients, means that no real assessment of the coronary arteries can be made. Moving on, TAVIs are increasingly being performed under local anesthetic, and having performed all procedures under uh, general anesthetic initially, for the last year we've been performing all femoral cases under local anesthetic. Uh, there is still not an awful lot of data about this, but there has been one meta-analysis which has suggested shorter procedure times and length of stay with no excess complications, and you can see that both the shorter procedure times and shorter length of stay were statistically significant. Uh, and this is consistent with our local data. This is our initial experience, albeit with uh, much smaller numbers. Um, one of the main differences with a local anesthetic procedure is that there is no transesophageal echo in situ. But despite this, we found no increase in contrast use or in radiation dose. Uh, what's my wish list here? Well, in future, I'm hoping that advances in no nasopharyngeal transesophageal echo technology will allow us to combine local anesthetic procedures with optimal procedural imaging. Moving on, one of the major advances in PAVI technology over the last five to six years has been the reduction in sheath size. So in 2008, we were using 22 and 24 French sheaths, as a result of which 50% of cases were transapical. And when we were doing femoral cases, we were using surgical cut down to access the vessel. Now we have 14 French E sheaths, expandable sheaths. The majority of cases are transfemoral, and procedures are truly percutaneous with the use of percutaneous vascular closure devices in most cases. And we can see here, uh, that I hope this gives you some idea as to the progressive reduction in sheath size that we've been experiencing uh, over the last seven years. Um, and this, uh, has, this slide demonstrates the attendant increase in transfemoral procedures, and this is data relating to all UK TAVI procedures over the last seven years. And here in the bottom right, we can see uh, a picture demonstrating the outcome after vascular closure devices. The wish list, um, well, in future we need more, smaller sheets, uh, and we need more information about who does need and who doesn't need the additional vascular access that we currently have with the procedures, such as central lines uh, and arterial lines. Pacing. Pacing is an important part of TAVI procedures. Uh, rapid pacing is usually required for balloon aortic valvuloplasty uh, and is always required for uh, implantation of balloon expandable prostheses. Uh, and permanent pacemaker implantation post-procedure is required in a proportion of cases where valve implantation causes uh, conduction disturbances. Uh, we can see that permanent pacemaker implantation is rarely required after implantation of the balloon expandable Edwards-Sapien valve, 
um, and that the incidence is falling in all types of valves as experience in positioning the valve grows. But temporary wires uh, remain a problem, particularly in frail elderly patients. You can see here that we do everything we can to avoid using them, uh, but they're still required in the majority of cases. Uh, and a big wish for me on the top of the wish list would be the development of some uh, non-invasive or less invasive method of uh, rapidly pacing the heart. Uh, final point in terms of evolution of the procedure, uh, we can see that length of stay has been decreasing from the start of the TAVI program. These are our first uh, 125 patients. Uh, and even in the early stages of the program, the median length of stay was six days for transfemoral cases. Uh, St. Paul's Hospital uh, in Vancouver are leading the way in reducing lengths of stay. And this is the latest data they have released demonstrating an average length of stay of three days and an average length of stay of, the less, of less than two days in patients on their low-risk pathway where they aim for next day discharge. So um, as a result of all these developments and the results of the randomized trials, the number of TAVI procedures has increased enormously over the last five years. Uh, and again, these are UK data. But uh, in line with the randomized trials, patients have generally remained high risk for conventional surgery, usually due to a combination of age, frailty, and or other specific comorbidities. Uh, we can see that in the UK, the average age has remained over 80, uh, and that the average Euro score uh, remains over 20. These uh, are the spread of comorbidities in our cohort of patients. You can see a lot of coronary disease, peripheral vascular disease, uh, and this is the usual spread of previous cardiac surgery, cerebrovascular disease, and COPD, as well as renal impairment. And the average age of our patients is high and, in fact, increasing. Importantly, we need to be aware that the average age of patients undergoing conventional aortic valve replacement surgery uh, in the UK is also increasing, so the surgeons are not standing still. And at the same time, their outcomes are also improving, uh, with the most recent UK data demonstrating really impressively low mortality of under 2% in the isolated aortic valve replacement group. Now, I'm pleased to say that TAVI mortality has also fallen over a similar period, and I think the figure for 2013 will be under 4%. Certainly our mortality for this year is under 2.5%. And while the mortality of TAVI remains higher than conventional aortic valve replacement, it's important to realize that these are two very different groups of patients. So this is data relating to all patients undergoing aortic valve intervention at the London Chest Hospital in 2011. We can see the CAVI patients are on average 12 years older uh, with a risk score that is three times higher than those undergoing surgery. And if we look at only at those patients undergoing surgery who are over the age of 80, they're a pretty similar age group, the TAVI patients and the over 80 uh, surgical patients, but the surgical patients are still lower risk. And if we select those surgical patients with a Euroscore of over 10, they're still a low risk and younger cohort of patients than the patients undergoing TAVI. So it is as a result of this combination of improving outcomes in high risk TAVI cohorts and a lower mortality and lower risk surgical cohorts that has meant it is appropriate to carry out trials designed to assess whether TAVI or surgery is the best treatment for intermediate risk patients with aortic stenosis. And I'll just go through these trials uh, briefly. Uh, the UK TAVI trial is a UK-based study aiming to recruit 808 intermediate risk patients by July 2016, and they're 
be randomized to either uh, TAVI by any route uh, or conventional aortic valve replacement. Quite an interesting design. Uh, anyone who's over the age of 80 can be recruited to the trial, and anyone between the age of 70 and 80 can be recruited to the trial if the heart team deems they are of intermediate risk. Uh, the Partner 2A trial uh, by Edwards Life Sciences, uh, randomizing people to either a Sapien Val, Sapien XT, or Sapien S3, uh, or to uh, conventional aortic valve replacement, is a US study, and they're hoping they have already completed recruitment. They completed recruitment in October 2013, recruited 2,000 patients, and they're defining intermediate risk as an STS score of 4 to 8%. Uh, and finally, uh, the sir TAVI trial, which is a Medtronic trial randomizing people to a core valve TAVI or conventional aortic valve replacement, and they're hoping to recruit, they're planning to recruit 2,500 patients. They started recruiting in March 2012, and recruitment is ongoing. Uh, and intermediate risk in these patients is uh, determined, uh, again, by the heart team. So we certainly need to know uh, what the we need to know that long-term outcomes, as well as the rates of aortic regurgitation and stroke, are no worse following TAVI than they are following surgery. And if we want five-year mortality data, we're really looking at getting some answers about what's best for intermediate risk patients by about 2019. So uh, in summary. Uh, there is a significant mortality and morbidity associated with conventional aortic valve replacement in high-risk patients, uh, and we know that TAVI is at least as good as surgery in high-risk patients, uh, that the TAVI procedures are becoming less and less invasive over time, and that both TAVI and surgical outcomes are improving. Finally, there are three ongoing randomized trials comparing TAVI with AVR in intermediate risk patients, and the results of these will be expected around 2019. I hope that was a useful presentation for you. I do have two questions, which will uh, I will discuss with you now. So are there any downsides to performing TAVI under local anesthetic? Uh, well, I think, the, as I mentioned before, the major downside is that you don't have a transesophageal echo probe in situ, and that is particularly useful if there's a complications, picking up complications promptly, and also for assessing uh, the valve and an aortic regurgitation post-implantation. Of, of course, one can do aortograms, but that does involve the use of contrast, uh, and with increasingly sophisticated transesophageal technology, the image quality is really very good. So there's no doubt that transesophageal echoes uh, are ideal, and that's why I'd really like to see some uh, major advances in nasopharyngeal technology, uh, advances not only in, in the technology, but also reduction in the price would, would be useful. Um, second question, uh, what is the sheath size we should be aiming to get down to? Um, well, I guess we're, we're down to 14 now, or that's, that's uh, an expandable sheath. So the size of the Sapien 3 uh, is actually, I think, 16 or 18 French uh, as the valve goes through the sheath. Um, it would be, would be nice, I think, if we could get down to uh, 10 or 12 or, or even 8. That would be fantastic. 8 is the sort of large sheath sized interventional cardiologists are used to using for complex coronary disease, and it would be nice to think we could get down to that sort of size. I don't know whether that's e even vaguely possible within the near future, but that would certainly be on my wish list and would lead to a, uh, a significant reduction in, in vascular complications. Okay, well that's uh, the end of the questions and indeed the end of this presentation. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you've found it helpful. Goodbye.